Hello there, I'm Mr. Tape Ed, and I'm the host of Cinema Royale at the night. Yeah, Just what kidding, the guys. fridge was that? I put you look my like... head down one second and I hear like some kind of weird Rastafarian voice and you had your VHS on your head. You look like you... Uh, you look like uh, uh, Wally hit the pavement or something, you know? Poink. There can be only one. They're here. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello, welcome to Cinema Royale, I'm your host Mike Mixtape, and it's been a while since we did an episode, I know, I know, I know, I know, you probably have questions, where have we been, and all that stuff, it's fine, we've been on a month hiatus, especially James and I, because we did canon films with Morgan last month, and then Matt came on, and we did Batman films two months ago, so we, did, we just took a little summer break, you know, celebrate 4th of July, you know, all that good stuff, you know, and now we're back in full force, talking about films from 1996, 20 years ago since Independence Day Resurgence, the sequel to Independence Day, came out recently, so that's why we're doing this episode, but before we get into the topic, let's uh, introduce the co-hosts, my brotherhood of cinema, my bros. First up, we've got Matt Brunet, also known as Animat. Yo, what's up, guys? I finally released a brand new top 10 featuring both me and James, by the way. So you could go check that out after this one. Mm -hmm. Well, that, at least that is when it's recorded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just link it in the description box below, just for convenience. Both part one and part two. Thank you. Both parts are really good. And surprisingly enough, it is the first time, like, I'm starting to notice this, but this is the first time ever that Part 2 is actually getting slightly more views than Part 1. Usually it's the other way around. Oh no, never mind. Actually, no, so I lied. Never mind. <laughs> oh, it's the same as Norm. Okay. At, least that, at, least that was, at least that's what happened last I checked. Oh, the views went up then. Yeah, pretty much. And... And last but not least, James Sullivan, also known as Hamitude. Uh, tonight's broadcast is brought to you by Animat's official elitist club, and me as Paul Schaefer. <laughs> but if you're going to call me an elitist, always remember, you just got to wait a minute. Ha 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 ha. Ah, yes, yes. We at Cinema Royale dare to be stupid. Yes, we dare to be. Uh, yes. Yes, we dare to be stupid. Yet our stupidity man manages to get away from the copyright system. Or so. does it? Actually, it does. I didn't get anything yet. Ah, uh, okay. That's a really good. That was a really decent cover too, actually. A little instrumental. Oh yeah, all all done by James. Cool. All done by James. Like fantastic. That was yeah. nice. I was listening to it. I was like, wait a minute, where's what what's this? That's awesome. And all I had to do was so copy nice. the MIDI file. That's all you have to do, people. Simple as that. But hey. Uh yes. And Matt does does my title card, so I, it was a favor well uh well deserved. Oh yeah, and yeah. Th thank you so much, man. Thank you so much. Like you really, you really, you really lightened up. Like you really lightened up, and you know, made 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 that top like that bit in top in the top ten special, man. You really did. <laughs> I'm trying to be like Morgan on your show. Basically, if I come on and do a cameo, I steal the spotlight. Oh yes. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yes. It's a it's a worth a watch, people. Seriously, check it out. It's a really good top ten. One of his best. Uh, but yeah, uh, speaking of sequels in general, like I said, Independence Day Resurgence came out recently, and it's a sequel to a 1996 film called Independence Day, and it got me thinking, like, what other films from 1996, 20 years ago, is worth talking about? I mean, 
That's 20 years. I mean, think about it. Like, I was six years old when that year was around, and I was a kid. Mm -hmm. It just made me think. It just made me think. Like, I remember as a kid, God, I remember Space Jam so damn much. That was the film of my childhood is Space Jam. That's the only film I remember from 96. Yeah, I, same, I would have to say pinpoint. same here. And I remember probably Space Jam would not only be one of the biggest movies of 96 that I remember, it was one of the biggest movies of the 90s. In fact, like, I would have to say it would be thanks to space, like the whole Space Jam craze that actually introduced me to the Looney Tunes. If it weren't for like, um, like the TV show, like uh, the Bugs Bunny Road Runner Hour or the Bugs Bunny Tweety sh uh, and Tweety Show, like the ones that appear, like the classic cartoons on TV. If it weren't for those, then it's absolutely because of Space Jam. Uh, that's one way to get introduced. Well, I was from the... James, I was born in the early 90s, so of course that's a way for me to be introduced. Yeah, Mr. 1984 right there. No. Uh, I, I, I don't think Space Jam's really a, a bad movie or anything. I just... Uh, I, I, I just, I just say, sort of look at it as being a, a nice little... a nice little fluff piece based off of an idea. You know, well, yeah, wouldn't no, it be great? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, sorry, go on. You know, it's it's got a lot of it's got a lot of glitz and a lot of glamour. The 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 animation, uh, you know, combined with live action, it was that that was actually pretty uh, phenomenal. But if anything, to get out of that, uh, you need to get out of that movie. Uh, that was it right there. Um, is uh, is just how well they they combine all the different elements, but um, there's really not much to the story. Yeah, no, that is true because like, yeah, because like it, it like it did influence a lot of people, but as a movie in itself, Space Jam is just a weird, weird movie. It's like one of the weirdest concepts that you can imagine. You got aliens, you got basketball, and you got Space Jam, and you got Looney Tunes. But like on the surface, plot-wise, this is like your typical sports movie. Like this is no different than any other ones, like the Mighty Ducks it's... or Cool Runnings yeah. or any of those. Like it has the same formula through and through, mm -hmm. but like. For some reason, they decided to add in that Looney Tunes, like, they decided to add in the Looney Tunes characters because there was that promotion with Air Jordans and stuff like that. And, like, Michael Jordan, it's debatable if he's a good actor or not. And, like, and plus, like, all the other basketball players that do appear in this. And, uh... Yeah, that's the case. And, like, overall, it's just... And, like, overall, the like, the whole plot, like, the whole, like, the what what the risk is... Like, what's going on, the whole setting in the world, it's just, overall, it's like, it's weird, and it's a concept that really is hard to grasp. Because, like, it's honestly, like, when you think about it, it's like, it's a concept that's a bit, like, the setting, it's a bit too off the wall. Like, how it really tries to connect the real world with the Looney Tunes world, and then you got, like, the space thing with more on Mountain. It's like... It, it tries a bit too hard. It, like sometimes it does feel like it tries a bit too hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can understand that. You know, watching it now it is, but it's it's been like a kind of a guilty pleasure for me. It was like it's well, I shouldn't even say that it's not a bad movie, but it's just something I remember as a kid. You know, because I was a big Booty Tune fan as a kid. So. Mm-hmm. It's worth at least a mention, but uh, uh, one of the main things of '96 was a Disney film was released that year. Ah, yes, 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 The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and often a pretty controversial Disney film, depending on the way that you see it. But and what about my of... movie? What yours is a Disney movie too? <laughs> Never mind, just go on. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh! Shoot, that's right, that's right. God damn it! Oh, oh God. Okay, well, forget it. 
Just go. Forget about it. It's my mistake. I thought it was... Just go. Ew. Go. Okay, go. fine, 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 fine. Uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Wow, what an interesting piece of animation that we have here. It was released back during, like, the height of Disney's popularity. Like, uh, this was, like, back when Disney was literally, like, almost at their, like, kind of, like, at their peak during that era. Like, th like they just released all their best films. Like, they released uh, The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, The Lion King. Like, sure, like... Pocahontas wasn't necessarily as good as those movies, but like they're still like people can still forgive. And then there's the Hunchback of Notre Dame, which is a bit different than what they normally do. Um, in terms of its tone, it's a lot more darker than a Disney film because it like it goes into uh, like some pretty serious stuff. It goes into some pretty uh, dark themes. Like this is the first Disney film that legit goes into uh, religion and um, it goes into lust and it like it goes into all these different like it, and it, it goes into death and like it, it like it actually legit has a pretty nasty death count and some of the ways that people die in there is like it's pretty bad and um, uh, I just like to say that all those except for lust uh, Disney has dealt with before like where no but like Never in a way like this, you know, they never featured it in such a grand scale. Like, maybe there is a bit of, like, religious tones in some of their previous work, but never, like, never so prominent where that it's literally set in a cathedral, you know? Um, okay. But I would have to say, in terms of its execution, like, because that it's dark, uh, it's, like, sometimes... Like, there are some things in this movie that they have done can arguably be, like, some of the best work, period. Like, they haven't done, like, there are some things that it would be hard for them to top this. Like, very few could. Like, maybe Beauty and the Beast can, but my god, it is amazing. The st like, the story, like, it's gripping, um, it's action-packed, and, like, it, like, you really get engaged into it. The animation is absolutely phenomenal, probably the best during that era. Like, it has a bit of that realistic tone. Uh, the scale is so grand. Uh, the designs are actually, they're a bit more realistic than they normally do, but it's absolutely beautiful to look at. Like, it is amazing. And the songs, every single song, every single number is not just like a little musical number. It feels like a massive event imagine if every single number has that grand scale and like that big feeling like the circle of life in the lion king if, like we're talking about that level from um out like when you think about it, like out there the bells of notre dame hellfire and heaven's light uh all those songs it's just, or god help the outcast it feels it, like they put it at such a grand scale, it feels like you want to give it a, a standing ovation to it. But then, uh, then there is um, if there's one thing that uh, some people are not happy about, like okay, number one, yes, it, like technically, some people are not happy with some of the changes that they made in terms of the story itself, considering that this is based on the Victor Hugo no novel of the Hunchback of Notre Dame. I do understand that, but keep in mind this is. Disney's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Disney would often do this, like, like they do this all the time with the classic fairy tales. They did this with Aladdin. They did it with Beauty and the Beast. They did it with The Little Mermaid. They did it with all that kind of stuff. So it's very common that they would. And how they executed it as Disney's The Hunchback of Notre Dame is honestly great as it is. Maybe it differs. Maybe it's a bit more lighthearted than it is in the book. But what they did there, like, it's pretty good. But then... You got the gargoyles. And if anything, mm. for many people, the gargoyles, some people would say, is what ruined the Hunchback of Notre Dame entirely. Um, I do, like, however, I will say in this case, like, in their case, the gargoyles, I would say they're not bad characters at all. They're fine as they are. Like, I do understand completely why they're in this movie, especially after the fact that they released um like after the massive success and the huge praise that disney would get 
after the genie from Aladdin and Timon and Pumbaa, like, it would be, like, you know, it would be understandable that they would also include that kind of uh, comic reliefs in this movie, you know, like, to give it a bit of a lighthearted tone and, you know, something for the kids to enjoy as well. Even though technically you have Clapin as well, but, like, he de- like admittedly, he doesn't necessarily appear as much. No, Clapin is sort of a psycho. <laughs> yeah, but I will, but technically I will agree, uh, like, the against case that they do feel a bit out of place. I mean, considering that this is one of Disney's darker movies that goes into lust and religion and, um, you know, abandonment and all, like, and uh, solitude, like, it goes into these really dark themes. So having, um, you know, having these gargoyles, it kind of feels out of place, especially how in the end where it kind of reveals that it's not just in Quasimodo's imagination. Like, they are legit, re- like, you know, they're actually real living gargoyles, considering how they help out, you know, how they help out in um, uh, trying to get the guards away from getting into the cathedral, you know, like pouring like pouring the molten lead or just, like, throwing rocks at them or, like, releasing the pigeons. And that's what's so confusing about them as as, as characters is that um, I think even in some of the print work because I was because you know I was I was reading all about this this movie and uh, uh, when it was coming out when it was being pumped up and it I believe uh, it was specifically stated on a number of occasions that the gargoyles were supposed to be uh, his imaginary friends. Yeah, honestly, I would, like, no joke, like, I could literally take this movie and I could edit, like, I could legit edit it so that we can take away those bits, like, just, like, probably a minute's worth of all those clips of the gargoyles helping out at the end to fend the guards away, and it would actually greatly improve the film. Like, it, it would at least greatly improve uh the like it would greatly improve the characters you know like understand who these guys are because like um like one living proof of how these guys are imaginary was at the end of a guy like you where like we we see like at, like the grand finale was like we see Quasimodo and like there are all these um you know valentines and hearts and love statues all around him and like all the all the gargoyles going like yeah and then like suddenly like we hear Quasimodo and then snaps back into reality and they're nothing but like, you know, just the religions, j- religious statues and you get the uh, different gargoyles like whole, like in different places. You know, it, it proved that they are imaginary characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wonder how... It, it's sort of like the... It, it's sort of Calvin and Hobbes in a sense. You know, you just sort of wonder how they... You, you know these guys have to be part of his imagination, but you have to question at the same time, how exactly is he lugging around these gargoyle statues? Uh, have you seen those muscles, man? I mean, he ha- like he like the dude has muscles, considering the amount of bells that he has to ring. <sighs> no wonder he's a hunchback. Oh, don't no wonder he's a hunchback. He's carrying around freaking... <laughs> Statues. Uh, but it also, and and also, don't forget the one confusing shot where uh, uh, the Jason Alexander one blows a raspberry to the goat. Oh yeah, and there's also the oh yeah, I forgot about the goat thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, like that's just a dumb little joke that they want it like. That's a joke that is kind of questionable if it works or not, like, depending on the person. Like, they just want to have, um, you know, you know, they just want to have fun with uh, the goat, like, just, you know, you know, uh, like, uh, what is it, Hugo has a crush on the goat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to say this much. I... The Hunchback of Notre Dame, the Disney version, I I was never, 
I was never a fan of I I was never a fan of uh, the film per se or any any version of the film for that matter. And before anybody gets butt hurt by by that comment, I don't think it's a bad movie. I just think uh, I I just I just thought that I don't know what what could have been done uh, to make it stronger. It's just not something that uh, it's just not something that necessarily appeals to me as a as a film, and I can't quite put my finger on it. Like now, have maybe it's book? have you read the book or I have not read the book, but I'm I'm aware ah, of some. Of the this pages. is interesting. Yeah, it, it, yeah. The one thing that the Disney uh, version did do was was keep with the themes of um, of corruption in the in the Catholic Church during that time. Mm-hmm. No, but like the one thing, yeah, like that, that that's actually very interesting because mostly when I would hear about complaints regarding the Hunchback of Notre Dame, the movie, is that um, a lot of it would come from victor hugo fans those are usually the ones who are the most vocal regarding um like why they don't usually like the hunchback of notre dame yeah it oh they well they can they definitely definitely um from where i'm coming from um i can see why it's an appealing it would be or it would make an appealing story towards kids um uh, after all, it's it's about a it's about a character who's who's an outcast who uh, uh, who who wants to be part of the society, and that's uh, that's who it um, that's who it appeals to uh, is kid is kids uh, uh, who feel like they're who feel like they're different. Here's a here's a character who. Who's just really, really, really different? Look at how they treat him. That uh, there's one scene that 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 comes out of nowhere. I think when it, in terms of the film, uh, the one the one showstopper piece that I that I actually do like, uh, the topsy turvy number. Ah yes, yes. And I know that this is this is also a scene that happens in the book, but. Immediately after that, almost spontaneously, the same people that are that are cheering him on, uh, that are that are praising him, strap him down, strap Quasimodo down, and start and start and start torturing him right in the middle, right in public. And I never, I never got that. I I was like. What 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 is wrong with these people? Well, it's the oh no 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 it's not like the regular people it's like, um like what really started was like, was with the guards. Yeah, because, it like, started with the guards, but the people are are the ones throwing the freaking tomatoes at them. No no like, no, it's even the guards. Yes, yes. I I just recent I have recently seen the film. Okay well okay well well. It started with the guards, and then like it started with the guards. You know the she, you know like, the rest followed, thinking mm-hmm. that it's okay to do that. No, no, it's not okay. On what planet? What what is the matter with these people? <laughs> that is a scene that always gets to me when when coming to this film. Um, the music. It, it it's always okay. It's it's not. For me, it, it it's not Aladdin. It's not the the Lion King. I actually have to say this though. Um, some uh, some people uh, that I know uh, personally will will be able to tell you that I'm a a major connoisseur of independent um, of independent musicians on YouTube. Uh, and I'd like to bring up the case of uh, Peter and Evelyn Hollins, two uh, two magnificent uh, singers uh, who uh, who got married, and uh, they they just have their own channels and they they create cover songs and albums and whatnot. 
Just recently, Evelyn actually did a cover of the song God Help the Outcasts. Oh. And here's the twist. It was actually in response to the Orlando shootings. Oh, damn. So it was done as a... It, it, she said it was her most... She said it was her most uh, requested song of all time. And I, I, I get why people like the movie version. I like the message and whatnot. It never struck me. It never struck me. And then I saw, and then I saw her video, and I was like, "Good God, this this, this fits perfectly." Yeah, like, oh my God, I never thought of it that way. I honestly never thought of it that way, but damn. Yeah. Like, like oh. when you put it in that context, when you think of the song, like, like wow, it makes it like even more powerful and even more. You know, it makes it it makes it current. Mm-hmm. Which is, which is surprising to think, considering like this is supposed to be set in like, rena like, part medieval, part Renaissance Paris. It's crazy. You know, that's pretty crazy. And well, yeah. I, again, going with the overall theme of the film, which is being an outcast. Um. That's uh, that's the that's the appeal of it, which I under which I understand. I always actually, funny story though. I, I remember watching the uh, the early test stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember back when, uh, back when this was, being pumped up on VHS. I think it I think it was the Toy Story, uh, VHS mm -hmm. that had an early sneak peek in the beginning. I got I got the wrong idea about the movie and they you know they have those sneak peeks with the uh, unfinished animation and whatnot uh, yeah, yeah. and i got this idea that i don't know how i got this but we get we are presented with two characters um quasimodo and captain phoebus and somehow the way that they advertise it the way that they cut it together I presumed at some point maybe there was going to be a, a a magic spell or something that turned Quasimodo into uh, into this handsome character. <laughs> what? It, it's it it would be it would be a Disney trope, would it not? A bit, but they wouldn't. I don't know. <laughs> like mm, that that would that would just differ a bit too much with what they're trying to do because keep in mind the goal is not supposed to be that quasimodo gets the girl he, he like all he wants is social acceptance uh, the no the goal of the movie is to say you can rescue the princess esmeralda and and uh even if you love her and whatnot but at the end of the day you're still a quasimodo and she's going to go for the football champ so uh no, but That's like, the real honest... message of the movie. <laughs> no, but honestly, I actually really like that because, like, you know, movies always tell – because, like, it becomes tiring that movies always tell you, like, you know, love conquers all and the main character always gets the girl. This one actually does something different. You know, this one dives into reality that you don't always get the girl, you know, and I love that for it. You know, because, like, at least it tries something different. Yes, there are some dumb parents who complain about it and end up getting Hunchback of Notre Dame 2 for it. <laughs> which, I'm which I'm allowed to say because Devin's not here. <laughs> but, um, oh, but she will listen to this podcast and give you hell afterwards. Yeah, she always gives me hell. I don't care. <laughs> anyway. No, but, anyway <laughs> but anyways, um, no, but, but yeah, like... No, like it, it it's a completely different message and you know it kind of goes away like it, it really fixates in the real goal that Quasimodo wants because like it, like even in the song out there that's what he's talking about he wants to be a part of the village he wants to be a part of society he never mentioned that he wanted to be with love you know 
Like the, the 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 like at the most, the only love story, the only love song you'll get is a guy like you, <laughs> and that's the gargoyles telling him that like he has a chance. But yeah, like overall, but yeah, like you know, it like it, it it's a gr- it's honestly a risky but fantastic message to say that you know to to do that. I and, guess so. Yeah, 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 and. Plus, I, I want to add as well, like, um, and this is something that's re- uh, that recently happened, that um, I think it was last year, off-Broadway, there was actually a play version of, the, of Disney's The Hunchback of Notre Dame, but they did something that's completely different. I don't think you guys have seen it, but I actually got the soundtrack, and it's actually great. Um, well, debatably. Uh, like there, there are some things that like it did pretty good, but there are some things that they didn't do as good as, uh, as uh, like in the movie version. But anyways, anyways, um, what they did is that they were only inspired by the music of the movie, mm. and as for the story, they stuck a lot more with the original book. If that were the and like I will admit there are some that. Like, Bells of Notre Dame, I will admit, it does have a better version. Uh, like, Heaven's Light and Hell's Fire, equally as good as the movie. But, um, I f- uh, like, Topsy Turvy, I felt like they kind of dragged it. And I don't know what the fridge they did with the Court of Miracles, but I don't know. I'm not, di- I, I'm not really digging it as much as the... Um, as the the movie version considering they tried a different level of whimsy in there other than the one that's like it, it's hard to explain like because like you got you got like a good beat with uh, court of miracles it's like maybe you've heard of a terrible place but then like you got like in the in the in like the off-broadway version like you get a bit of a slimier version where it's just clopin singing it's like maybe you've heard of a terrible place with the scoundrels of palm and then then and then maybe you've heard of the place that is called the court of miracles hello you're there so it's like this slimy version, and honestly, like, on one hand, like, it, like it's honestly a bit of a mix. But I would like to know what you guys think. Like, if they kept some, of, if they kept the song, some of the songs, because like they they don't have a guy like you for obvious reasons. Like, if they kept some of the songs from the movie and they stuck a lot more to the story of the book, what do you guys think? Hmm. I don't know. Do they? Uh, you mean? You mean uh, everybody dying in the end and possible necrophilia? I don't know. I didn't fully check into the. I didn't fully check into the store uh, into the story of what the play did, but maybe. Maybe. <laughs> um, she gave me water. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Well, that's, I, I guess, that's all I have to say about it. What about you, Mike? You're uh, you're pretty quiet. Can you guess why I've been being quiet? You don't. You haven't seen the movie in a while. I haven't seen it. Period. Oh my god! Really? No. I like honestly. No. This is the kind of movie that honestly I highly recommend that everybody would give a shot because honestly. They like, even though this may not this may not technically count as like one of the best Disney movies, but like it's one of my fa- like I would put I put it as one of my favorite Disney movies because some of the stuff they've done in there, it is freaking phenomenal. Mm-hmm. It is absolutely like they'll you'll see some of the best Disney moments yes. in there. See how tall he is? He's four feet tall. My dad is measuring out a chair for me right now. Say hello, Man, Dad. James, you on, you're on a podcast now. Huh? Jeez, G- really? James, you shrunk. Huh? Oh, 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 there he is. Oh, my guys. 
There, there. Am I waving? Yeah, there. It is. Yeah, it's working. It's working. <laughs> That's my dad doing a walk on cameo. Today's lesson is James is four feet tall. <laughs> yeah, he's a small little midget. <laughs> this has been words of wisdom from James's dad. James, sit down. We don't want to see your crotch. I'm six foot tall. Come on. Don't don't sniff it either. What? You put your head really close to the webcam there, Brene. <laughs> I'm doing a thing. It's not for sniffing. <laughs> well, because you don't know what dick smells like, apparently. Oh, gee. Why do I want... I, I'll, I'll keep that as a good thing. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm serious. It, that's a reference to a video we did. So, guys, if you want to see what I'm talking about, <laughs> just click the link. Oh, I don't know. Oh, more. I don't know what dick smells like. Good. Never smelled your own? <laughs> yes, because that's how I get myself off. I smell, like, I smell it to get a boner. I sniff my way to erection. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> only, on, only on Cinema Royale, we keep it classy. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, yes, I've... Okay, let me explain. I've... Never had any interest into Hunchback whatsoever. That's why I never watched it. I just thought it was just I wouldn't say a, a silly Disney movie. I'd just be like, you know, it's the subject matter, you know, the the setting just didn't appeal to me. So it just felt like it was like, and eh, a Disney movie I can skip, you know. Oh, don't like honestly, I say don't, don't skip it. Mm -hmm. There you go. Maybe. Maybe I'll consider giving it a watch once and then move on. So I'll keep that in mind. I'll def de definitely check it out. I mean, it's not real. Like, if you're not as attached to the original Victor Hugo book, I, I say definitely check it out. Uh, so, yeah, from one Disney film to another Disney film, which I totally forgot it was a Disney film altogether. Uh, he's revisiting it tonight since he did a firm page of the picture episode on it in particular. It's James and the Giant Peach with James Sullivan. Oh, that. Oh, that's true. Yes. That particular uh, bit of nostalgia for me. Yeah, I, I talked a lot in the uh, From Pages to Pictures episode about my interpretation on the, on the film. But what I, uh, what I really sort of want to, and and you know a lot of my personal history with it, um, I'd I'd like to take the time to uh, discuss here um, some of the more behind the scenes aspects about it. Um, uh, I remember, I remember. Um, in uh, in particular, there was a. Uh, there was a documentary that was being shown, I believe, on the Disney Channel. Around the time of the film's release, you know, had to pump it up and whatnot. Uh, one of the major elements of the, of the film is, uh, okay, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the story of the film, it's about a boy who lives with, uh, uh, with two abusive legal guardians who uh, who make his life miserable and uh, uh, one day he gets a, a magic chance to escape from there but uh, uh, by by using uh, magical crocodile tongues which it, it, it's such a it's such a weird Mad Libs put together story um, Unfortunately, he spills the crocodile tongues on a peach tree, which grows to ginormous size, and on the inside, there's giant insects. 
in the pit of the thing. And so he and the giant insects uh, escape the escape the house. They roll the peach down the hill and land in the ocean. And next thing you know, they're uh, they're on wa- on their way to New York City, like you do. Um, but one of the but one of the big uh, one of the big moments that I that I was always amazed by was everything in this film is stop motion. Um, at least, no, no, no. Let me clarify that. It's one of those films that go, that starts out live action, ends live action, but a month amidst the way blends uh, uh, blends that with an, a form of animation. Then goes into stop motion. Yes. So that's what um, uh, that's what uh, uh, that's uh, one thing that I always found impressive. But there's another thing. Um, they have a they have a villain here of a giant cloudy rhinoceros oh yeah <laughs> then suddenly a giant rhinoceros came out of nowhere and ate his mother and father <laughs> and escaped from the zoo yeah that's that's the thing is that in the book there it was just a rhino that uh, that escaped that escaped from the zoo mauled a couple of folks and then and then that was it he was never thought of in the story ever again uh, after that. Uh, in the movie, they turn it into this big... that They they turn the, the rhino character into this... into this demigod, basically. Basically, like a metaphor of uh, James's fears. Mm-hmm. It, it's, a, it's a flying beast. Just... Uh, Incredible, and I always looked at this thing and I said, "Is this the one point in the film? I, that's got to be computer graphics. That's got to be computer." Probably, probably because um, with Henry Selick's movies, they're not a hundred percent. They're not a hundred. They're uh, yeah, they're not a hundred percent stop motion. Like there are, like there are absolute, like especially with the cloud effects and stuff like that. They're not. Um, yeah, like I would say, it, like if it has stop motion, it would be at least minimal. At least the rhino itself, but like the cloud effects and his appearance w- is mostly uh, CG. Uh, actually, here's the twist: the rhino was not CG Ooh. at all. Neither were the clouds. Really? None of that was none of that was computerized. That was all practical. Most here's, impressive. Here's, wow. here's how they accomplish it. What you're watching, uh, the rhino that you're looking at is actually a puppet with, uh, with lights uh, set up inside the eyes uh, to make it look like the eyes are glowing. And... Uh, they submersed it in a water tank. Oh, oh, that's right. So that, uh, uh, so that um, you know, when operating it, it would get this sort of slow, flowy. Yeah, look yeah, to yeah, it. yeah, yeah. And so it's the, basically, uh, so it's a puppet that they did underwater. Mm-hmm. And the clouds. That's. That's ink that they were pumping through the puppet. So you look at this thing, and it's got it's got clouds flowing out of its nostrils and whatnot. Oh. All that is just ink. That because in the uh, that is clever. Oh, that is nice. I'm looking at this and I'm like. The this scene that that terrified kids in the audience when uh, back in 1996 is a freaking puppet and a and a submersible tank. Yeah, 
Exactly. It's an aqua. It's an exactly. aqua rhino. Aqua rhino. <laughs> yes, instead of a instead of a a sharknado, it's an aqua rhino. <laughs> sharknado versus aqua rhino, <laughs> coming soon from the asylum. Make that happen. Make it happen. No, don't. Oh god. <laughs> no. Oh, god. Aqua rhino. It ain't just hungry, hungry hippos anymore. Rhinos are in the act. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, the rest of the film, in terms of animation, mainly it's uh, mainly it's stop motion with the uh, with the uh, little CGI enhancements uh, here and there. Um, they got. Uh, they they also have that uh, that dream sequence, which is part uh, which is part hand drawn. Looks really Monty Python. I always thought that when I was a kid, I was like, "Isn't that the Peaches song? Like when they sing about eating peaches?" No, oh, this is after that when he's having the uh, when he's he's a that's the only explanation for the dream is that he's in a food coma. Oh, <laughs> he's like I just had a oh, dream. We gotta have our dream I, sequence somewhere. Yep, I ate a I ate a monster load of uh, load of peach filling, and now I just gotta. Now I had a dream where I was a caterpillar being chased by a rhino. Oh yeah, that part. Yeah, and then you also got like, uh, yeah, the evil aunts were were a part of the dream as well. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, they. Yeah, it it's a very cerebral. Uh, film, in in so many different ways, uh, uh, they originally were going to uh, have uh, the actor playing James Paul Terry, um, uh, just be a live actor throughout the entire film. Mm-hmm. But it was like in front of a blue screen or something, and then it yeah. That but it was it be... was just too complicated. Oh uh, yeah. And then they, and then they ended up doing that sort of thing for Monkey Bone. So, and we know, we know what happened there. Yeah. But and the um, only thing we got was just a Nikki. We were just like, we only got a, a panicked Dave Foley looking at the camera, telling everybody to take off their clothes. <laughs> and that that film could have been a masterpiece. I, I think it. I really think it could have because there was so much effort put in. It's it's like one of the, it's honestly one of those films that I want to say like it would have worked if given to the right hands, but like it, you're given to one of the to one of the greats in stop motion, Henry Selick. So like maybe in terms of the script, it could have been improved, but yeah, like I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's a little bit off topic, but. Um, in uh, in terms uh, and and going back to uh, the film James and the Giant Peach, um, I I I actually have a uh, have it on a, a account that um, a friend of mine around the same time at the film when I was reading Disney Adventures. The American version of the magazine. Uh, he was actually getting his hands on the New Zealand version of Disney Adventures. Mm. I didn't know that there was different versions in different countries. And apparently, there's a comic that went along with the film. Hmm. That is supposed to. That is supposed to. Answer a question that we never asked and when I when I think back on it now it is perhaps one of the dumbest explanations hmm. what is it what were the ants doing the whole time wasn't it swimming or something driving along the the bottom of the of the ocean in the car nope Maybe they took maybe they took the same path like in um, like in the the Muppets or oh, which one was it Muppets or Muppets Most Wanted? 
Apparently, accord, according to what I recall, according to this comic, the ants were busy trailing the peach the whole way. And at one point, they turned their car into a mechanical shark. What? Huh? 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 What? Yeah, so the so remember that when you're watching the movie, according to some stupid comic, the ants were the ants were really inside the mechanical shark the whole time. That makes no sense. If they were in the shark, then they would have probably seen James and they would have come out of it. Exactly. And I don't know, maybe they maybe they ex- explain why suddenly they show up as a why the why the two ants show up as a uh a strap to the strap to the front end of a sunken ship at one point later, but um I no. No, we didn't ask for this. We didn't ask this question. And uh, I, I just sort of look back on that, and I'm just like, this is uh, th- this is a funky little memory that uh, I would like to I would like to challenge our viewers, see if they can come up with a digital copy of that comic somewhere, Ooh. like Disney Adventures 1996. Dig it up, New Zealand. Maybe you can find it on eBay. Rare yeah, James eBay would be your... comic yeah, with we're... dumbass eBay. plot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe like eBay would be your best bet at that point. And the- I mean, there could be some ma- massive collectors out there who collect collected all the Disney Adventure magazines. You know, someone in New Zealand probably did. I remember during that time period, back when back when Disney was releasing one animated flick after another. One thing they did was. Uh, uh, they they did they did uh, comics based on these these adaptations. You know, two every two months, uh, they would have two month specials uh, detailing everything about Pocahontas and uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame. So, why they why they did this uh, uh, for James and the Giant Peach? I have not I do not know. And Dad's underneath my chair again. <laughs> He's Did checking out my like? chair. Don't mind him. He's busy working. <laughs> yep. I love this man down here. <laughs> um. Yeah, it's an interesting movie where I do remember watching it as a kid also, which I totally forgot about until now, but yeah, it's another film I remember watching, you know, 20 years ago as a kid when it came out and got it on VHS at one point. It was a, it was a classic in the household. It, um, hell, any Disney movie for me was a classic for me. Like, I grew up on Disney films, so James the Giant Peach was one of them. Right after you Ryan said was... that you haven't seen Hunchback? <laughs> I, we didn't have Hunchback, that's the problem. I think um, maybe my mom and dad didn't get that. Uh. Uh, I don't know. It depends on what films I got as a kid. It was just uh, we're a weird family. Leave me alone, Matt. It's called video rental. Exactly. It was a thing back um, in the day. But I know, but we never. I just never got into. I don't, that, that. Um. <laughs> the rhino did scare me as a kid. I was one of those kids, but now I'm learning what. It actually was. I'm actually surprised. I was actually flabbergasted by that. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. But, yeah, it was an uh, interesting film, to say the least. And that was 20 years ago, dear God. Mm-hmm. We're all so old now. <laughs> yeah. 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 Where did the years go? Well, I got nothing else. Where did the years go? Where did the years go? Where did they go? Where did they go? 
Where did they go now? Where did those years uh, go? Where did those years go? Um, I just want to briefly mention about any Pens Day, because, uh, mm. like I said before, the sequel came out this year, so it's worth uh, a mention since uh, yes. July weekend was last week. Ah, uh, uh, yes, yes, uh, Independence Day, yes, yes, it's already 20 years old, yes, yes, I remember, yes. yeah. And they make, <laughs> and they made a sequel 20 years later, which was interesting. It's like, really? 20 years and you pop out with a sequel, which is... Ah, yes, but surprisingly, good. didn't make, even though it's 20 years old, it actually didn't top the box office over a movie that has a sequel and is 13 years old. Ah, yes. I I guess Roland Emmerich needed uh, needed to go back to the heyday of his career. Yeah, but now um, he's gonna do the same thing. I heard. Uh, uh, did you hear about the plot the plot of his next movie? He's basically remaking Majora's Mask. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's no, legit. I have not. What is this? It's okay. <laughs> what okay people? If you like, people will get it when I mean like. It's legit, like, Roland Emmerich's Majora's Mask, because it's literally about the moon coming to Earth. Oh, wow. Sounds like a fascinating concept, actually. Yeah, and, uh... After being 20 years old, it still holds up, actually, because uh, Morgan James and I watched it recently, and it was... I watched it first time in a while, because it's been a while since I've seen it, and uh, it was a very decent action film. I mean, Will Smith was charismatic as fuck. I mean, he was during his early years of acting, you know, he was, got that swag from French, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. It was pretty cool. Jeff Goldblum was Jeff Goldblum. Um, yes, but, uh, but Jeff Goldblum has always been uh, Jeff Goldblum. Yes. But what about Boomer? What about Boomer? Boomer will live. <laughs> Boomer is a doubleable. Just... Don't, don't question Boomer. <laughs> Boomer is my favorite. Um, but yeah, the the whole independent, the whole White House uh, explosion. You know, that was it. That's 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 their money shots. Even on the freaking cover of the VHS box it's, it's it's their money shot i was like we gotta blow up the white house and you know, it was a your money shot <laughs> so they had a uh, it's it's definitely don't don't watch i like with the sequel that came out it just they it's very lukewarm and uh, people a lot of people are it's it's meant at most but if you want to go back just watch the original it's worth the watch like, it's a great action thing. I mean, the 90s were all about the action films, mind you. I mean, Independence Day was number one at the box office during that year. You had Twister. <laughs> a fucking Twister. There goes a cow! <laughs> a cow! We got a cow! Uh, of course. <laughs> Hang on, we got cows. The original uh, Mission Impossible came out 20 years ago, so the franchise is still going strong today. Uh, Michael Bay's The Rock with Nicolas Cage and Sean Connery came out that year. Uh, 101 Dalmatians came out that year, too. Oh, That's yeah, that is true. That... Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. That was a fascinating uh, game, I say. Yeah, we mentioned that. It was a... Yeah. Uh, let's Remember. see. Rock... Ron Howard's uh, no 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 not Ron Howard uh, it was uh, John Hughes. Would you? I'm talking about another film called Ransom, you dipshit. Oh, never mind. <laughs> I was going. It's a Touchstone Picture film. I was going down the list of box office movies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Nutty Professor. The Nutty Professor came out twenty years ago with Eddie Murphy, uh, Tom Cruise, and Jerry Maguire. Show me the money. Show me the money. <laughs> but uh, at the very bottom of the top ten uh, box office movies of that year was Eraser. Uh, 
Arnold Schwarzenegger film, uh, which is interesting enough. Um, so much. Okay, I can do this really quick. Um, Racer is a Arnold action flick about Arnold being quote eraser, <laughs> meaning that he works for the witness protection program, and he, of course, you know erases people and puts them in the witness protection program and protects them from, you know, until they go to trial. Um, he meets up with one of them, uh, played by Vanessa Williams, at the time. Um, she's working for a uh, tech company, you know, she's got some trade secrets about something. Uh, I think it's mostly about rail guns. Mm -hmm. um, so in the rail guns in this movie, oh my god, they just they're these huge like assault guns, you know, they have a scope and it's like a green scope and you can see like x ray vision kind of through like houses and you can actually pinpoint a target, you know, you can see through the house, see the person, it's like an x ray and you can actually like sniper like a heart, so you could just hit it right to the heart, you know, and then and a the thing goes go like really fast too. It's like a really fast kind of uh, projectile. I was like, whoa! Like they, they they were nominated for special effects at the Academy Awards. So, I mean, I, no wonder it was really good special effects with it because they really wanted to focus on the real guns in the movie, make sure the audience was felt in danger of it because they were just like. We want you to be in danger because these real guns are freaking serious in this movie. Yeah, that's the main point of the movie. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I remember before Mike and I tried to watch this together before I fell asleep, and uh, and and uh, one of the things that we watched beforehand, uh, you brought up the Siskel and Ebert review. Yep. And yeah, they, they reviewed it. They did a little. Uh, they did a little. Uh, uh, talk uh talk about the rail guns and uh it's not it it's not something that uh that they just came up with in science fiction it's uh, uh rail guns are are actually a thing in the film that they they explain that oh these rail guns they're a prototype uh, hat, uh for a handheld or something like that and they talk about real. They talk about real guns in uh, in the in the film. That real guns have actually popped up in different games. Even I think the the Quake series used a real gun. Hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a concept for a gun that uh, that um, uh, that has uh, gone all over uh, popular media. And the idea for it, it is actually a thing. And I remember while watching the movie, uh, I searched up a, a picture of some test footage of a of an actual railgun uh, decimating a target at uh, uh, at uh, uh, some close range, maybe. Uh, and maybe caught it like uh, 120 frames a second, slow motion. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, the uh, it just looks like an explosion, but all your but there are no explosives in a, in an actual railgun shell. Uh, all the the flame and eruption that that an actual railgun comes up with, that's just from the friction it gets from being fired so fast. And I'm showing this picture to Mike of this target being decimated, and he's just sitting there like... <laughs> oh, my God. I was like, whoa! That's, that was, like, badass. I was just like... <laughs> That's why I kind of got into the movie, because it was like, I, I knew about the rail guns in the movie. I was like, okay, maybe I should just watch this. And I was like... Look at it and see how it does it. And of course, towards the end of it, too, because there's, there's a lot going on in this movie. It's like, it's a typical action film. It's got, it's a simple plot, you know, kind of, you know, going there. Um, there's a twist in the movie, 
and I don't I don't think I should reveal a twist because the twist is there's a mole within the organization and that's the bad guy and the villain and just turns the whole movie into this big climatic thing. It's interesting to find out the twist. It's really cause I, at first I was like, "Whoa, really? That's the twist!" Like it might be not a good twist, but it's, it's at least a a decent twist, you know, just uh, for an action film like this. Um, but the you know stuff happens. You know, all the witnesses are being killed off one by one, and leads up to her. And it's like, "Oh no, Arnold Schwarzenegger has to protect her," so they are on the run, kind of. They're trying to had to prove that this happened, this happened, that happened. It's 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 action films. So you gotta think like very simple stuff and um like the last hour of it is like it's just freaking amazing. Like there's a point there uh he's on the plane and he's trying to get off the plane, you know, and he's jumping out of the plane, he's got he throws a parachute out, he goes for the parachute, dives in it, skydiving style without the parachute, tries to put the parachute on, puts it on you know, and, he, and Arnold does all his stunts. Like, he does... <laughs> he just, just falls to the wall, like, in the air, putting it on, and then all of a sudden, the uh, the twist bad guy is in the plane, and he is making the pilots uh, turn the plane towards Arnold, you know. I want... He, and the guy's like, I want his face on the windshield. <laughs> He's trying to aim the plane, the plane's, like, coming right at Arnold, and all of a sudden... It goes Phew. Don't you know you just can't kill the up. governor with an with an airplane? <laughs> that was that scene. That airplane is my lunch. <laughs> but, um, but the, I think there's the iconic scene in the movie that everybody should know because it's you know Arnold's known for his one-liners and one of the one-liners in his in this movie is that there's a shootout at the zoo. They go into the reptile house, and he's only got, like, two bullets left. So he shoots the tank for the alligator <laughs> tank. And the alligators come rolling out and eats the bad guys. Like, <laughs> and uh, one one of them comes towards Arnold, and he's sh- he shot at it. Bang! And he's like, your luggage. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> That's the best line in the movie. Oh, that is good. I, la- I laughed. He's like, "Your luggage, bang!" <laughs> okay, that is good. Like, I was hope, like, I was in my head. I was like, going, "Oh, please don't say see you later, alligator. Please don't say see you later, alligator." But that luggage thing, that is funny. <laughs> but I was looking at the trivia for this movie, and uh, so the one scene. That scene, they use animatronics, CGI, and real al- alligators for that scene. So there, there was bad CGI in there, but they also used animatronics and real alligators. And the crew called them crocagators because they use a combination of gators and crocs, which I thought was interesting. Because I was, I was rewatching it today because I, it's been a while because I fell asleep with James the first time watching it with them, and I had to rewatch it for the podcast here, of course. And I was watching that scene, I was like, okay, there's some CGI in there, but I'm looking at like, that's animatronic, and that's a real gator, and... But the one that came at Arnold was definitely CGI, I was looking at it, I was like, oh my god, and they did a slow-mo of actually him shooting, and it's like... <laughs> but... It's... Eraser... <laughs> it's like, there's other scenes that work too, it's an Arnold Schwarzenegger film, and... You get those. There's there's a, there's a scene towards the end where there's a shootout or like there's a. It's all about uh, trading or selling like those rail guns. They're they're that's what the bad guy's doing. He's selling these rail guns to these terrorists or these cartels, you know, underground kind of stuff. And there's there's a, there's a shipment going on the docks. There's a sh- scene at the docks and. Uh, yeah, so Arnold gets these two rail guns. He somehow gets these two rail guns, and he starts just shooting them. Just like there's one scene where a car comes by and he starts shooting them both, like, psh, 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 psh. and the car goes flying, psh, flaming up, and he goes right into into the river. It's like that 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 that's not how it works. They're heavy guns. How is Arnold lifting these freaking guns up? But I'm thinking, okay, he's got the muscles, of course. For this, like, what the hell? 
Shut up. Like, like shut up, I can. <laughs> He's our the question, Ed. This is a guy... Exactly. This is a guy who makes an action movie riding on a horse. <laughs> yes. Yes, but... Uh, there's a few other things I noticed, like, this is probably, like, the second film that he walks into a gay bar. Like, the first time was in Raw Deal, and actually the third time was in Terminator 3. Three. Three? I, was, I was watching, I was like, wait a minute, gay club? What is this, a trend in Schwarzenegger films now? Like, he he walks into a gay club looking for a friend, you know, for asking for help, and he's like, I'm looking... Gay Club. Why does that sound familiar? Oh, it's in Terminator Three, and I read up just now. It's on. It's also in Raw Deal, which I've seen before, but I totally forgot about. But it's like, what the fuck is with the gay bar scene? But um, it's interesting. The uh, you have um, you have Swokshner, you have Vanessa Williams, James Ka is in this film too. He plays a character, and actually his role was originally supposed to be played by Jonathan Price. Hmm. Mm -hmm. James Caan. would have been interesting. Yeah. 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 I was like, okay, I, I can see Jonathan Price playing that role, but I was like, James Caan, because he, he really does big blockbuster kind of movies, and he was like, it's a good story. And I was like, eh, it's a decent story at most. It's just... It's like 20 years ago, we had a our Schwarzenegger film, you know, action film, you know, and I don't think there was anything after, well, actually, there was another film that came out the same year, too, Jing All the Way, <laughs> which is another Schwarzenegger film. Well, that was 96? Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, that was also 20 years ago. Yeah, same year, as I was looking up the uh, other films that came out. Um, yeah, so if you want to... <laughs> Excuse me. If you want to see a film that's action, full of Arnold, and especially the one-liner of your luggage, <laughs> it's it's a, it's something interesting to check out if you are a big fan of Schwarzenegger like I am. Mm. But you know that's only one film from 1996. There's plenty others. Like it's a good film year, like, to be honest, like, I'm looking at the films that came out, it was a decent year, I mean, I just realized that both Eraser and Notre Dame were released on the same day, oh, damn. so, I was like, but, and that's the thing, I was reading up on, too, but Eraser was number one at the box office for that weekend, so, it kind of beat out Notre Dame that weekend, um, in a sense, uh, D3, The Mighty Ducks also came out that year, too. Oh yeah, because more Mighty Ducks. Quack, 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 quack. We need to kill this uh, franchise this... and then, and then uh, regurgitate it as a as a Saturday morning cartoon. <laughs> ducks rock. Man, ducks. ducks rock. <laughs> ducks rock. <laughs> Oh, Romeo plus Juliet was also that same year. Space Jam, like we said, Jingle All the Way. Actually, Star Trek First Contact came out 20 years ago. And yet, we're going to have another Star Trek film coming out this year. Yeah, Star Trek Beyond. Mm -hmm. Star Trek. Mars Attack. Star Trek The Great Beyond. Beyond. <laughs> Scream came out, came out the same year. Uh, Babes and Bye to Do America came out this year, too. Oh. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> fire, fire, fire! <laughs> <laughs> yep, one of the biggest, one of the biggest quotes ever to get out of those guys, other than other than uh, Killdozer. <laughs> Killdozer. All of that comes out of nowhere. Sure. Oh man, like I don't love the Killdozer. Uh, Independence Day. What else came out? Harry the Harriet the Spy came out that year too. Oh, that that's a classic right there. Mm, I know, but here, here's another classic which I just realized it was a Touchstone Picture film, Kazam. What? Oh my god! <laughs> I just realized it was Touchstone. <laughs> I was like, really, Touchstone? You had to release Kazam? 
Maybe they pull the string. But... Maybe they pull the strange magic. Disney just doesn't want to be associated whatsoever. <laughs> You never know, they could remake it eventually, like, as a Disney Channel original movie. Oh, yeah, because they're gonna so remake it to Green Eggs and Hammett. <laughs> That's Green Eggs uh, and Hammett. Kingpin, Joe's Apartment, The Adventures of Pinocchio. What the fuck? Oh, I remember that one. Oh, I think I remember that the one. one with uh, Jonathan Taylor Thomas playing Pinocchio. Yes. Yeah, that's that weird one. Ugh. Name me one Pinocchio that's... adaptation that's not weird. Uh, Pinocchio is weird after all. Uh, Matilda came out the same year too. Oh, oh. awesome, Shosh. Oh well. Oh, Jack too. Wait, oh, Jack. Jack Robin. The Robin Williams movie. Jack. Yes, Jack. Oh, okay. That oh, Jack, that Jack. Yes. I didn't say. I didn't mean two as in the sequel. I just was re looking at the films. Uh, no, I speak of sequels. Escape from L.A. was released that that year too. The sequel to Escape from New York. Uh, Alaska. Bears. Bear. A very Brady sequel. Good sequel. First. Uh, first kid with Sinbad. Ah, the stupids. Oh my god, the stupids. Tom Arnold. Bug Hall. Oh. Oh my god. Does that movie sound like it's gonna be a good movie? <laughs> no, the stu not really, but... The stupids. The title of the movie and for its target audience. <laughs> It was it was based on it was based on um fuck wasn't it based like a set of books too with illustrations and stuff because towards the end of the movie there was a a cat and dog that was in the books and they, they were like animated and it was like what the fuck's going on and it was live action throughout the whole movie and towards the end you see the cat and dog and they're just like animated like freaking animals <laughs> it's this movie. Uh, uh -huh. why would did he do that? It, it was a weird freaking movie. I mean, I, I remember it too. Cause it, uh, the Crow, City of Angels. Oh, the Adam Sandler, Way Damon Wayans movie, Bulletproof. Uh, oh, Jacques Van Damme film, Miss, uh, Maximum Risk. Uh, James and Devin saw Fly Away Home. Mm-hmm. She she freaking loves that movie. Fly away home. I think it's cute. I'm trying to see what else. I'm trying to run the clock out. What? Yeah, we got about four minutes left. You're trying to run the clock out, so you're just rambling. <laughs> yeah, I so knew we I like... knew we would finish before the timer, man. You're just stalling. I like to stall, okay? Ooh, barbed wire. You know, I'd like to see that at some point, just as a, just to see if it would be like a guilty pleasure. Barbed wire? Yeah, we can is it, try to find a Oh, you mean the Pamela Anderson movie? Isn't that like the Pamela Anderson movie? Yes. Hmm, might be, might yes. be a consideration then. Yeah, we could do that for a screening. Just get a copy of that. It'd be pretty interesting. I've only seen the Saj Critic review of that. Um... Oh, Rat. that one. Okay, now I remember what it is. Yeah. Oh, Flipper. Flipper with Paul Hogan and Elijah Wood. Frickin' Flipper. Spy Hard. Uh, Dragon Heart came out in 96. Yay! John oh, yeah. Connery Dragon Shall Live. It's the Cable Guy! That came out in 96, too. Oh, right. Cable Guy. The cable guy. Na, 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 na. Oh, what a freaking awesome year. Like, I'm looking at this like, this is my childhood, damn it. I remember all these movies in recent years. Uh, Dust, Dustin Checks In, Biodome. 
From Dust Till Dawn, Black Sheep. You're you're not tossing Biodome in the category of good movies, are you? It's a guilty pleasure. I mean, I like Polly Shore. Another what? <laughs> yeah. I like Polly Shore. What? I I even seen them live doing a stand up. You're a sad, strange little man. <laughs> Well, I, I can understand maybe jury duty, but... I mean, Biodome was okay. What? I mean, I, I was more I was more like the, the son-in-law kind of person. Ah, yes. Oh, yeah, that... That little forgettable flick. <laughs> I like Polly Shore, shut up. Um, Happy like Gilmore, Polly another Shore. Adam Sandler film. Oh, I actually saw that not too long ago. It's like it, it's dumb. It's a bit dumb, but like it has charm. Yeah, remember back in the day when dumb Adam Sandler movies could get away with their charm. Yeah, really. What happened to those? I don't know. <laughs> Stuck in the nineties. Yeah. Stuck in the nineties and early two oh. thousands. Muppet Treasure Island came out. Oh, the same that's time, true. Yeah, that was 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. Walt Disney. A lot of Disney films this year, actually. I'm surprised. Nowadays, we don't get as many Disney films. Oh, as of course we do. If we, count, if we count, like, the Marvel movies and Star Wars movies, yeah, we got a lot. What do you do? Well... Oh, I guess that is true. Okay, never mind. Okay, I guess, because I was going to say that not all of them are animated. Never mind. Never mind, never mind, never mind. Oh, the Birdcage. A.M. Seller. Uh, Robin Williams. Blah, 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 blah. Whoa, don't, ever don't ever mistake uh, Robin Williams with Adam Sandler. <laughs> don't do that nowadays. That is... Yeah, that is, a, that is a crime you committed right there. Punishable by death. Justifiable homicide. There's our timer. There, you're stalling work. Happy now? Yes, I'm happy. Because I'm happy. Come along if you feel. Don't, for don't force yourself to be cool and hip with the young crowd, Mike. That song is already dated. I mean, you sang it last year. What are you talking about? Well, that was because it was still trending last year. Okay, but yeah, this has been Cinema Royale. Uh, what other night? Well, of course, I listed them all, almost all the '96 films. But what 1996 film do you like? Please leave a comment below. Make sure you subscribe for more Cinema Royale. I promise you that we'll be back on schedule after this hiatus. I'm sorry, but there'll be more content coming on this channel. Um, give it a like if you liked this episode, and uh, share it if you enjoyed this madness of episode. Thanks for listening and watching. Uh, and uh, next time, next time, uh, Tarzan came out this month, so we're going to talk about Tarzan films next time. Tarzan, ad Tarzan adaptations. And today so, we're going to look. Yeah. And next time we're going to learn that there are more Tarzan adaptations than the Disney one. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And people are be like, wait, I only know it in 1989 film with Phil Collins doing the soundtrack. <laughs> Two worlds, one family, and the one where he ta he talks almost perfectly, you know, kind kind of doing the Disney touch, not uh, not unlike Hunchback of Notre Dame. Ooh, that's dangerous territory, dear James. <laughs> Them's fine oh. words, boy. I just realized there's a connection, like. Bell walks in a cameo in Notre Dame. I know that because of the internet. And then, so there's BBB's Notre Dame. And then in Tarzan, they have the dishes from Beauty and the Beast. Don't think too hard, Mike. <laughs> it's connected. It's in the same timeline. It's 
somehow in the same timeline as a theory. It's like the Pixar theory. theory. Just a theory. An animated yes. theory. It's uh, it's just like Bambi's mom having quite the career after her death. <laughs> Makes about as much sense. Uh, yes, yes, but yes, uh, yes, 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 next time is Tarzan, so get your Tarzan gear up. I might go see a Legend of Tarzan, who knows, we'll see what happens, I'll talk about the new film. It's got all the good stuff. Samuel Jackson's in it, Margot Robbie as Jane, uh, Alex Skarsgård as Tarzan. It's gonna be interesting, people. Tarzan is next time. Isn't there also week, Christoph so... Waltz as the villain? Oh, they have... Yep, as the... They have a scars. They have a scars guard playing, uh, uh, playing Tarzan here. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, people know. Yeah, he's all ripped and all Tarzaned up. It's 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 it's. I don't know. It's. I'll definitely talk about it next week if I go see it. So, uh, other than that, thanks for listening and uh, Longland Cinema and Adios Amigos. See you later, dudes. Show for now.